Hello everybody, my name is Lewis and I'm coming to you with this Sunday School lesson for February 25th. And this lesson is entitled, The Good Fight of Faith. And we'll be taking our text from 1 Timothy, or 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 21. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God, who giveth, giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Sunday school lesson. Open up our heart and our understanding to what it is that you would like for us to take from this lesson. Lord God, grant us, O oh God, knowledge and good nuggets to take with us on our life's journey here in Christ Jesus. In Jesus name amen and so we begin with the book of well book it's a letter the letter written to Timothy who was a young man uh, and Timothy was well no uh, Timothy uh, Paul was well well um, acquainted with Timothy and his family his family being uh, Eunice his mother and I think Lois is the name of his grandmother and they were very, very uh, rich in faith and good deeds uh, in the early church. And Paul honored them. And not only did he honor them, but he took on their child, their son, their grandson, and, and made him his own son in the gospel. We see also we see that uh, uh, written. Let me see. It's First Timothy. First Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. And so we see that Paul regarded Timothy as a son, and that makes him not only the son in the gospel, but we also see a clear picture of who this man Timothy was. This man Timothy was a young man, uh, in contrast to Paul, who's, who's a lot more seasoned and now is in, in a state of, at which he can he can uh, impart knowledge on younger people to carry on the gospel. And so Ephesus was a place that Paul first preached in when we when we read in the book of Acts um we we actually remember I think it was uh, Areopagus uh where he he teaches or teaches against or preaches against the idea of to the unknown god. And so we see Paul in that time frame actually went to Ephesus as well and began his ministry in that region. And so now Paul is now imparting more knowledge onto his son, gospel son, Timothy, so that he can carry on the pastoralship in Ephesus. And so we see that Timothy is the pastor according to uh, um church tradition and also uh, you know the the inferences in this letter 
And so Timothy is the pastor uh, at Ephesus and Paul is instructing Timothy to not not give in to these fights, these these bogus fights, these fights that gender uh, confusion, um, the, the, the people is going to start, you know, challenging him because of his youth and all this other stuff. But he, he tries to admonish Timothy to be a little bit better than the, the, than most in his age bracket. And so he now is trying to trying to equip him with a st with a mindset that not too many people his age uh, can have because of maturity. And so Timothy is now about to take on a great responsibility of taking on a pastoral ship. That means he he now governs the lives of Christian believers in this region in Ephesus. And so, what's another thing? Oh, Timothy, the word Timothy means honored by God. Um, and also, what else we have? And so, the, this, book, this, this letter is basically going to touch on three, there may be more things you can uh, gather from it, but these are the three main things that I, I've um, grown accustomed to whenever I go to Timothy. It addresses false teaching. It addresses church behavior being put in check. And it also addresses self-checking, meaning as a minister himself, that Paul is now uh, instructing Timothy to check yourself. You know, that uh, old, I think it's a rap song, check yourself before you wreck, it, wreck yourself. Well, he's admonishing Timothy to check yourself, meaning your behavior among all these people, because they're going to use it if, if, you, if you're not careful against you. And so let me continue all. So verse 11 starts off. And of course, we're in the middle of a thought. And this is, you know, for brevity's sake, you know, Sunday school lessons, take it from the beginning like that. Uh, they're beginning scriptures in the middle of a thought. But it says, but thou, O man of God, which is a contrasting statement taken from from another thought. This is just half of a thought. And so, but is a transitional statement that goes from one place to another. And so, what is it that he's trying to, to say before verse 11? So, let's actually look at that. And I'm going to, um, I'm not going to read everything, but I'm going to start at verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. And so we see that there is a, uh, there's obviously something that Paul is coming against, um, not just in false teaching and, and arguing about vain things, but also the behavior that comes from such things. And so he's not only uh, digging at the root, but he's also digging, he's also knocking the, 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 the foul fruit of that tree off of its limbs. And so and I hope you understand my imagery there. Uh, not every tree bears a good fruit to eat. We have the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that was not a tree that we should have eaten of. And so rather than eat of the knowledge of tree, uh, the knowledge of the good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, we need to dismiss it. We need to uh, regard it, uproot it in our minds and don't even regard the, the fruit off of the tree. And so he's he's now going for the root of the problem which is this false teaching and anything other than Christ's teaching. And so if it comes from Christ, then it's going to bear good fruit. The, the teachings of Christ is wholesome. And the things that come from wholesome teachings is always going to be good. But if it's aside from Christ and, is, uh, and we're skewing away from the doctrines that he spoke, then... You you better bet right now. Don't bet. <laughs> Don't gamble. 
but you better make it make it all uh, certainly sure, assured in your mind that the things that are not all uh, that does not come from Christ are not wholesome and should not be given the gravity that it has been given to all uh, given to you even uh, you may hear a, a statement given in the world and is come from v philosophy it comes from a man's imagination it comes from um, you know ruminations of people's minds and the machinations of their imagination I, I know I'm using a whole lot of stupid words but um it comes from earthly understanding, earthly wisdom. And even Paul talks about uh, wisdom that's from beneath. Um, so we're not going to get into that completely. But this is what where he's saying, to uh, as, as a man of God, come out of this. And then he says, but thou, O man of God. And so we can see what the contrast is c clearly when we go back to ver chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. We can also go into six through six through ten, because this is also where Paul is leading to towards the end of today's lesson, where it talks about the rich people, rich Christians who are rich themselves. Don't let their riches govern their 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 lifestyle, and so they should be able to be rich in good works, or uh, if they call themselves rich even in this world, and not allow the riches to deceive themselves as though they are blessed because of their riches. And so we have a problem in today's day and age. And I'm going to take a, a, just a minute. We have a problem with church people in this day and age thinking that gain is contentment or gain is godly. That gain, meaning the gain of money, the gain of property, the gain... Of, and we, we often think of it as and th these things can be blessings. Don't get me wrong, but we don't we don't measure our blessings or measure our standing in God through the things we own in this world, because it is for sure. And I think I think even Paul talks about it. I don't know. Did he talk about it? Oh, it's in it's in chapter six, but he doesn't talk about it in today's lesson. Uh, so let me actually go to that. And read verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Therefore the things that we gain in this world. It means nothing in the grand scheme of things. It means nothing for eternity. And so whereas we have Paul teaching us to lay hold, lay, uh, lay hold on eternal life. And not only says it one time, he says in verse 12 and verse 19, lay hold on eternal life. But the second time he's mentioning it to those who are considered rich in this world, that they be rich in good deeds and lay hold on eternal life rather than laying hold on lifestyles of the rich and famous. And so we have people who are drawn away from the church and from the doctrines and from the mission and from good, wholesome teaching and have perverted the gospel with with this greedy, incestuous relationship with the world that thinking, you know, that because they got stuff that they're blessed. That couldn't be any further from the truth, according to Paul's words. And Paul, knowing what it is, what it is like to be, you know, a businessman. He was, he was, um, uh, he he actually had a business, and he made money, and so he, money wasn't a big thing. And then when he preached the gospel, he he knew how to be abased and to how to abound. He knew that at times he would be destitute of food. But he was able to use that as uh, in, in, in its time, you know, against and for himself. Do you understand what I just said? Where it's our relationship with Jesus Christ gives us the power to be both against and for our own selves. And so we can be we can uh, we can be content in any mean, in any way, in this life, no matter what comes towards us. 
if somebody says bad things about us with their words or even hits us with their hands, we know how to behave and react to those things. Um, and so we don't we don't re react and behave like the world. Therefore, our witness will win at the end of the day. And this is another thought in in his in his letter that he talks about a witness that even the witness of Jesus Christ through Pontius Pilate, you can you can get a good witness out of Pontius Pilate, even though Pontius Pilate did what he did. No, uh, he saw nothing evil or bad in Jesus Christ and was willing to let him go. But because he was, you know, who he was and he was more afraid of men than than uh, than God or than God's work. He, he went ahead and did what he did. So the, the point is that there is a witness there. And Paul is now transitioning the idea. Well, if Jesus had such witness in the face of uh, crucifixion in the face of persecution, in the face of false witness and bear and people bearing false witness against him and, uh, and, and, and sending him through judgment hall to judgment hall. If he had that witness after all, then who are you, Timothy, to not be just like the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he, Paul speaks from experience knowing that there was a lot of things that were oh, that could have been witnessed against him that did not fall through because of the mercy of God. We see that in chapter 1 of uh, 1 Timothy. And so let's continue, because oh, I don't want to go too far in, into that. Uh, that's And this is one of those books that I would love to you know break down as well. But uh, let's, let's continue. Um... But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So instead of falling back to what normal men probably would fall back into, you, O man of God, you, O woman of God, I'm talking about you there watching this video, you need to react and behave differently because you are now God's shining star in this world. And so now look at the word follow or actually the phrase follow after that comes from the Greek word dioko, which means to pursue, to aggressively chase. And then I saw, which was very uh, interesting to me, dioko also means persecute. And so where do we see the word persecute even in the, in the letter to Timothy? I, I go back to... 1 Timothy 1 verse 13 where he's talking about himself and let me go a little bit further um, before that verse 12 and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry who was before bla a blasphemer and a persecutor and so I looked up the word persecutor here and it's another form of the okos meaning he was the one who provided the okos. And so the octase is the, you know, the, the nomenclature given to those who do the diokos. <laughs> and so he was the persecutor, not just persecution or persecuting or following after people, you know, aggressively pursuing them. So he was, uh, and so we see that Paul is transitioning what he used to be. And now he's saying, rather than being what you used to be, use what you used to be and use that same energy and turn it around for good things. And so the good fight of faith is turning what you used to be and using that same energy and using that same energy to uh, actually do um, the work of God with the same energy. So rather than Paul persecuting the church, he now persecutes righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And so the, how am I using the word persecute? It is the pursuit after. It is an aggressive search. It is an aggressive chase. And so we are aggressively, and, and this is what he's now saying to Timothy, 
I used to be one way, but now I'm this way. And now I'm teaching you to be the same way. Aggressively follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight is something that usually is negatively connotated. When you fight, you're brawling, you're hitting, you're wrestling, you're coming against. But it's used here in a good sense uh, in a spiritual battle because faith is spiritual. Um, when, we, when we think about Jesus and what he has taught us, we believe those words. We don't see it before us, but we believe it now. We believe it with our heart. And we take it on and now we aggressively do the things that we believe. Be not hearers of the word only, but be doers also, James said. And so lay ho um follow after means dioko, pursue aggressively, chase, and persecute. I think that's very interesting, and we, we're gonna see more of this type of language from Paul. Verse 12 is our today's key verse. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And remember, he eventually talks about Pontius Pilate and having him as a witness of Jesus Christ and what he means in this world as a profession. Jesus Christ is professed by the Father. Uh, the Word of God has been made manifest and professed to the world. And we see this profession and Pontius Pilate saw the profession and he witnessed a good confession. Uh, not profession, confession. And so uh, it says, wherefore thou art, uh, let me go back, lay hold. This word lay hold is epilambanomai, which means to seize upon to aggressively seize. Now, not only are we following after aggressively chasing, but now we're going to lay hold on it, aggressively seizing it, you know, gripping it, taking it with hostility. And this is a word that's brought out in the definition as well. So epilambanomai means to seize and to be hostile towards the seizing of the thing. And so we're being a hostile to eternal life. Can you imagine? The, eternal life is um, an intangible idea. But we are being hostile towards this intangible idea through our faith. And now we know that faith without works is dead from a couple of lessons ago in James. How do we lay hold on eternal life? And how can we be hostile? And how can we aggressively chase and pers pursue or persecute these good things? It is through our faith and actually doing them and making it our business to do our faith. And so if you're not doing your faith, then you're not really being aggressive and you may not even last long. Uh, so let me just continue on. I give thee charge in the sight of God. Who is the, the subject that Paul is talking about? God. Who quickeneth all things. Who quickens all things? God. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Well, who made this confession? And it was brought out by Jesus? God. I'm not profession, confession. I keep saying profession. This confession that Jesus is who he is comes from God. And so Pontius Pilate saw what came from God and he witnessed it a good confession, and that was Jesus Christ himself, that thou keep this commandment. Now, what commandment is Paul referring to here? I don't remember him saying, thou shalt do this, or thou shalt not do this, but he's talking about Jesus Christ. And where, where do I get that idea from? Let's go to uh, 1 Timothy 1.4. Uh, because in 1 Timothy, no, no, 1 Timothy 4.6, it says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, minister of Jesus Christ, a servant of Jesus Christ, a server of Jesus Christ. Nourish up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. 
And so what is the commandment that he's talking about? The things that Jesus Christ actually embodies in the things that he preaches. Every good word that was taught by Jesus is something that we should parrot, that we should repeat, and that we should uh, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and continue doing that and saying that and preaching that and working that and showing the world that. So what is the commandment? Jesus Christ, who is the confession of God in this world. Without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are now, by commandment, preaching Christ Jesus, all of his doctrines, all of his words. And let me all add another scripture. And earlier in this chapter, chapter six, verse three, it says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. And so what commandment are we, are we, are we, is Paul telling Timothy to, to obey? He's talking about that particular commandment, the commandment of Jesus Christ himself. And again, this goes back to how we, we don't fall back on the law of God, a law of Moses. We fall back on a new law. And this new law can be found in Romans, is either seven or eight. Chapter eight. It says, for there is, th there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law... This is the law that we do now obey. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. So Jesus Christ is the commandment. We live a lifestyle according to Jesus. Jesus is our doctrine. He is the commandment. And as long as we continue to preach Jesus, we obey the commandment. You get, I hope you all get that. Let me all continue. And so we ought to do this without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning we, we have to keep this commandment of preaching Christ and him crucified and the kingdom of God and everything that it entails. Every word of righteousness, every word of godliness, following after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, everything that involves those things in Christ Jesus. We fight that good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life because it's all in Jesus. It all it encompasses within Jesus. And Jesus is uh, God's confession to the world of who he is himself. I am your savior here. And then we, what we see is Jesus Christ dying on the cross, buried in a, in a, in a borrowed man's tomb and rose on the third day with all power in his hand went on into glory into the heavenly the whole the holy of holies within the heavenlies and he presented his blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat in heaven and so we have that jesus and so everything concerning jesus and what he did is our commandment uh the doctrine of jesus christ i have referred to that very many times do a word search on that you'll see also let me uh, i also got second john 1 9 so go to 2 John 1, 9. Two John 1, 9. It says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And so this also comes into the, um, the idea of who Jesus is and who Jesus is going to be revealed to be. Uh, if you don't already know, Jesus is God manifest in flesh. That's if you don't already know that. But there is an order of things. And God has an order of things. He even has an order of who's going to be resurrected first. He He has a, um, Jesus Christ being the first fruit, first born, first begotten of the dead. And then they which were in the grave... They're going to be raised first. And then we who are alive and remain, we're going to be raised. And then all together, we're going to be presented. 
And then finally, there's going to be a time. I've mentioned this in, in, in my study in, book, in the book of Hebrews and also in many times. There's going to be a time where Jesus now points to God and said, Okay, all this faith and belief and love and fellowship and everything you have in me is all good. But I'm not going to be the, the son of God forever. I'm going to be who I said I am. And I am. And that's, that's all I'm going to say. I am. And we're going to finally realize who the I am is and what he has done through Jesus Christ, the son of God. The man who was born into this world in Bethlehem on that fateful day. Uh, so let me continue. That thou keep this commandment, which I, I gave you a couple of supportive um, scriptures of what, what is being referred to. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show. It's still talking about God in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. Before Christ, Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. God witnessed a good confession. Uh, Jesus Christ being that confession. Jesus Christ being that commandment that we keep this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, meaning Jesus Christ is going to come again and he's going to appear to us and we're going to continue doing this work, fighting the good fight of faith until he appears in the sky like he promised. And then he says, which in his times he shall show. Now, Jesus declares God. Jesus shows everything that God creates. Jesus is the means by which God created every and all things. Invisible and visible. He is the firstborn of all creation. And so therefore, he is the one who will be able to show these very things. Who is the blessed and only potentate. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who only hath immortality. Now, only there means by one's self, meaning there is no other besides. There is only one, and we also see. Um, let me let me not even go there. Oh, um, yeah, why not? So Timothy, First Timothy, um, I think it was chapter two. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus is a temporary manifestation. It's not a forever manifestation of a man. And, but we will see God in the form that we have seen as Jesus. Jesus is the expressed image of God's person. God having one person. Jesus being that express image of that one person. And so now it tells us in verse 16, chapter 6, verse 13, 16, who only, talking about the, the image of Jesus Christ, who God is by image is Jesus Christ, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. This goes back to what we know about God, that God is a spirit, according to John, uh, I believe is um, John, I want to say four, six, I'm not sure. But God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But God is a spirit, meaning we don't see spirits. We don't discern them. We cannot discern them unless that spirit makes itself discernible. And God has made himself discernible through Jesus Christ. And so verse 16 also talks about a, um, a no man have seen that is language taken even off of, off of uh, John chapter one, verse 18. And no man hath seen God at any time. Uh, only the son of man has declared him talking about himself. Jesus has declared God. He has made himself visible to humanity. So when we see a throne in heaven, and when we see someone sitting on that throne, it will be Jesus, the Christ, who, who was the Son of God, but now is going to be revealed in his times, who is the, all, the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, 
who only have immortality, dwelling in a light which no man can approach or to whom no man has seen, nor can see. We still cannot see God as God. And so that's just the truth. And if any man say they see they seen God, uh, tell them to point with their finger where God is. You'll find out that the scripture is true even at that moment. To whom be honor and power everlasting. Honor and power everlasting. Now to the man God has named, you know, of course his mother may have named him um, Timothy, honored by God. But we ought to honor God. And so here, Paul definitely gives honor to God, who to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So be it. Let it be done according to as it has been said. Verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world. This goes back now to the rich that are rich in this world, that they be not high minded. We don't we don't accept pride and uh, haughtiness, nor trust in uncertain riches. We don't trust in riches. We trust in Jesus and his provision. Uh, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. Not just rich in money. Mo being rich in money is not bad. And as we see in uh, earlier, early on in chapter 6, it says, For we brought nothing to this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation. This is the, the ease of those who are rich can easily fall into temptation. But it's not impossible for God to save a rich man. As long as that rich man knows who he is and knows the state in which he has to be. And to even a rich man can fight the good fight of faith. Even a rich man can, can uh, with his riches, be rich in deeds. And so it's not a sin to be rich, but this is what I'm eventually headed to. They that would be rich will fall in, uh, will be rich fall into temptation. Will meaning willing or desire to be rich uh, will fall into temptation, a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So it is not a sin to be rich. It is a sin. It becomes a sin when you desire riches and are willing to fall into lust and into sins and to snares. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And this, and this is where uh, Paul begins again. So we're taking that concept or that idea into today's lesson that those that are rich in this world, that they be not high minded. But verse 18 says but that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. I want to point out also, so that people make it very clear, that the scripture does not endorse communism, does not endorse socialism, does not endorse taking from the rich to give to the poor, meaning taking from the rich to give to the poor. What it's endorsing is that a rich man, out of the abundance of his own heart and his, you know, his uh, converted heart, I should say. A man who is now a Christian should be able to use the, the, the riches that he has and, and like Paul did with his actions, convert them into Christianity. Whereas I said earlier that Paul was a persecutor, a blasphemer. He, he pursued them aggressively. He killed them even. He had orders to take them. And he persecuted them and he laid and, and, and laid seized on them. So he converted that and says, now lay hold on eternal life. Uh, pursue and persecute even, you know, the righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Do that. Pursue those things. Just like I pursued Christians in the times past with all my zeal and all my fervor. I'm going to use all my zeal and all my fervor to pursue these good things. Now, rich people, just like you have these riches in your world, in, in the world that you come to know, you're not now living as unto yourself, but now you have, uh, now you, can, you have the opportunity to fight the good fight of faith 
and live out your faith through your riches. Being rich in good deeds and good works. Let your faith be known and use that money as tools for the kingdom, of course. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, they who are, he's talking about is the rich. Uh, the, the rich laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they won't be uh, drawn away by their lust and fall into all these kinds of lust because of all the money that they got. They, they feel like they I got the money. I could do it. Let me just do it. You know, it's really hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. Uh, we see that Matthew 19, verse 23 through 26, but I'm not going to read that. Uh, it says, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. And so he says, uh, again, to these rich that they, the rich, may lay hold on eternal life. Same word seize epilambanomai, which means to seize and with hostility seize eternal life. And so you have the same power that poor people have in seizing eternal life. And so what's being said is that your money can't buy you, uh, can't buy you your faith in Christ, can't buy you salvation. So it is for rich people and for poor people alike. Poor people may find it a little easier than rich people because they don't got nothing. Rich people, they may have all these things handed to them and may be drawn away. But the same fight occurs for both types of people. Be, so Paul is in essence teaching this equity uh, among all kinds of people. And so the behavior that is in the church is one that people think that gotten gain is godliness, which is far from the truth. And so, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. And the word science only means knowledge, great knowledge. And so people use uh, their knowledge, so-called knowledge, uh, as though they, they know something. And so not only are, is riches of things an, a problem, but even knowledge, a riches of knowledge is a problem. People who profess to know everything, people who got master's degrees, doctorates, and, and all these things, they have it in their mind, and all of it all comes out of, you know, pretty much pride. It even talks about not being high-minded. And so this is the common thread between rich people and so-called knowledgeable people. People who get all these degrees in life thinking and nobody can teach them nothing. They're so haughty. You can't teach somebody who thinks they know it all something. I don't have degrees, but God has been feeding me with the word of life so that I can do probably much more than what a person with PhDs can do. Which some professing have erred. Talking about all these uh, fault, these sciences, you know, falsely so-called against Christianity, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And this word erred is meaning out of step, out of line, missing the mark. And so people have missed the mark. They have become out of step with God. They have uh, been out of line with his standards. And so is as concerning the faith. Remember our law is in Christ and we need to stick to Christ and everything he has taught. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy, stick to what you've been taught and don't go out of line. Don't go on. Don't blur the lines. Don't go out of line. Don't try to think you can go under it, above it. Just hit it head on and just stick to the truth. Be in the doctrine of Christ. Live this doctrine of Christ. Behave yourself in the middle of all these people and teach people to behave themselves. And not only that, you're going to be a good minister if you remind people of these things. And so that is a good fight of faith. And again, our fight is something that we now have to do vociferously and even, even uh, violently. The kingdom of God uh, suffered violence, but the violent taketh it back by force.
I, I know I add it back, but take it by force. And so we need to be just as violent as the spiritual, the spiritual wickedness that's out in the world concerning the faith. We have power from our source, who is the own the blessed potentate. He says that he's the own blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And then also, where is it? Where are you? Ah, to whom be honor and power everlasting. And so we have a source that has everlasting power. He is better than an energizer battery. He keeps going beyond what the energizer rabbit can do. We go beyond what people can do in this world. We don't do what we used to do. We, we, we are now converted and do better. And so let us fight the good fight of faith. Whereas when we used to fight for other things, we used to be all power to the people back in the day. How about we be power to God? Power to the people for God. You know, be that way for God. And forget about the old things and press towards the new thing. Jesus Christ being the, the head of it, being the center of it, and, being, and just be worshipful in that regard. I promise you that you will succeed that um, that that scripture can be true for you. This is the victory that we have, even our faith. God bless you and have a great day. Bye-bye.